Alright, the tutorial today is about Linux Terminal Server Project and essentially what that is is a lot of you are familiar with the small grid terminals um, that are available in a lot of businesses and they're essentially devices that have either no disk or small disk space and they're supposed to be pretty cheap and you throw them on there and people can connect to your server and the server does all the processing and just sends the images to the client and um, client goes ahead and displays it to the user and away we go and uh, I recently got myself a, a WYSI or WYSC S10 thin client and I thought let's see if Linux has a thin client or a, a terminal server which it does and I set it up and it works great so I'm gonna do a little tutorial on how to get that working on um, the first thing there's an LTSP how-to um, works pretty well uh, we'll go through the steps here. So essentially, it's just uh, I'm gonna log in there. HP 12. All right, and we're gonna do sudo apt get install ltsp server standalone, and that has everything you need. Um, it's already. Um, Oh, well, there we go. Um, it's already installed on my server, so I don't know why I'm bothering to go back and do this, but it uh, gives you the complete server, and LTSP build client is what you're going to do next. Um, just make sure you're doing the right architecture, like my server is 64-bit, so um, what I added on the end was uh, Arch uh, i386 to make it uh, not a 64-bit client as well, because a lot of thin clients can't boot that. Um, another thing is that Debian used NFS to grab the uh, the operating system and shove it to the thin client. But what I wanted to do was use MBD, so I added also to the build client uh, the squash uh, FS dash image, which was nice, and so I just added those two to the end. And essentially, once that's installed, you have pretty much the server ready to go. Um, you just need a few more things to get people to the server, think clients to get to the server. Um, but LTSP, uh, the few uh, commands it has are LTSP build client, which we just talked about. LTSP uh, change group essentially allows you to log into the thin client OS and make changes um, right from your server. Um, I believe LTSPFS manages the file system. Um, this allows you to mount the file system and then LTSP-info is nice it shows you info about your server um, shows you that running Debian 6 um, and shows what's installed LTSP client, client core, control um, all that good stuff and then it uh, finds the packages in the actual, this is opt LTSP i386, that's the actual environment that's shoved to the thin client. And uh, LDM, the desktop manager, client, client core, um, I'm not sure what these are, but um, that's the image file that uh, tells you that you did a squash FS image. So, And if we do LTSP again, um, local apps is something we'll cover in a later tutorial, hopefully. It essentially, or if we have time, we'll grab it in, in this tutorial, but essentially local apps just allows you to run the apps on the thin client. If the thin client actually has some processing power, a lot of times um, YouTube videos and you know VLC, all stuff like that, anything for video-wise doesn't work on the thin client just because of the processing network and all the other requirements that go along with it. Um, the update image is when you make changes to your image and you're not using NFS, which... Um, we won't be in this one. Uh, it allows you to um, make changes to the uh, operating system and then you would run update image and it would create the IMG file right here. So, um, update kernels. Uh, what the LTSP update kernels does is if you make, if you, I think if you update the, the environment, the thin client environment, uh, it copies the kernel and everything from the, the uh, opt LLTSP i386 etc and there um, to the 
uh, var lib tftp boot, uh, which we'll cover in a little bit. Update SSH keys, I think they just say to run that after you change network settings so that it updates the security settings. So, um, this opt LTSP i386 etsy um, lts.conf is where you make a lot of your changes, um, which we'll take a look at later as well. So essentially right now, um, what you should be configuring is DHCP. Um, however, I have a Linux-based router. So what we're going to do is log on to that, and we'll, that actually handles our DHCP stuff for us so that we don't have to worry about it. So, um, and if we go into the DNS mass settings, we can specify DHCP boot equals pixie Linux dot zero comma comma one and two one six eight one dot one hundred. And so if a client is trying to pixie boot, it'll direct them to one nine two one six eight one one hundred, which is my server. Tell them to look for pixie Linux dot zero. All right. Um, so essentially, um, you would install the TFTP server. Okay, that takes care of our DHCP, and since we're not using NFS, if you were using NFS, you would add this to XE exports and install the NFS server. Blah blah. Um, now we should install. You can install TFTPD dash HPA, and then you might have to follow these directions to add all that sort of thing to it. And that's pretty much it for setting it up. Um, we bypassed a lot of that with uh, our router having DWRT on it. But if we go into TFTP boot, um, you'll notice here pixielinux.0 is there and pixielinux.cfg is a directory. So if we go pixielinux.cfg and This is our, this right here is our label that shows LTSP, that's what it boots. And the kernel is located at LTSP, I386, VM, LI, and UZ. Pend, read only, this is all just stuff it needs to boot. And we're using NBD, so we have to add NBD port equals 2000. So, if we back out, please, LTSP, and then R386, which was this is all item automatically generated after you do the build client command. So, so this here is, um, and this also has like a GPXE, um, and it has NBI, but we only need the Pixie Linux um, does zero and the Pixie Linux does CFG, um, and that's all stuff that by default it looks for this. We had to change. It in ours. Let's go back. So if we look at the default, this actually when it's generated, it says kernel, and then just says all this is deleted. It just says VML and UZ. Um, but, but I just changed the folder structure. That's all I had to do, and it, it worked just fine. So since I already had Pixie Boot in place, as you can see, I had. Oops. I had Debian, Fedora, Clonezilla already uh, there to boot, and this just helped. So this is just one more thing I had to add to my to my menu. So um, and we actually have a virtual machine here. Test LTSP. Let's look at the settings. Essentially, we just did Linux of the Linux, 256 megabytes of uh, RAM. Um, absolutely no hard drive. Um, the network is where we did a bridge adapter, we bridge it to my main adapter so that it would, it would be on the 192.168.1.100 network, it would be on that network. And then I changed promiscuous mode to allow all so that it works and then I changed the MAC address so I, I hit refresh on it. And um, it works fine. And let's go ahead and... And then we're going to hit F12 and hit LAN. I'm just going to search for that server and i got to quick type something so it doesn't auto boot but it hits 192.168.1.100 and then this is the menu that shows up here um, if we want to see that what we can do is dun dun, dun 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 
that's our actual menu right there. We we uh, did it in boot.txt, but um, so what all we need to do is if we had just waited, it would have you know automatically gone to this. But type ltsp underscore i386, hit enter, and it's gonna talk to the server. The server's gonna it'll take a second for this part of it. But uh, if you're running NFS, which Debian does by default, it's a lot longer than this. This was actually very fast um, compared to the first time I did it with NFS. But uh, the nice thing about this is username, if you already have an account on your server, which obviously I do, you can go ahead and log right in. And you don't even have to create any more accounts or anything special like that. And the really nice thing is Oh hey, I had this in my folder already, my my regular slash home slash deranger. Um, and boom, it pulls it in. It pulls in all the files that were already in there. So, And as you can see, this is just a regular Linux desktop, nothing too special. It's fair, as you can tell, it's extremely responsive. Um, a lot of, sometimes thin clients have issues. Of course, I'm, you know, on the same LAN segment and everything, but um, you know, it's very quick. You can click on things and they pop up. Although I, I think I've had issues with the root terminal not starting, but um, other than that, ooh, hey, oh, could, oh, that's because of VirtualBox. Huh, that's odd. Never seen that before. Um, but let's just say we launched something like Murmur, and then there you go. Um, that's my Murmur server. Uh, for voice chat, which nobody nobody uses anymore. I'm not sure why I even have it installed on my server, but whatever. But as you can see, very quick. Open a web browser, very quick. Um, the problem you run into is if you go to something like youtube.com um, Oh, I don't even have the Flash Player installed, but the point is you can't even play it because uh, it looks like I do have the Flash Player installed. Or not. Um, what happens is everything is generated on the server. Yeah, there goes I'm looking for. Everything is generated on the server, so it has to send every single frame to the client. So that can be an issue for videos. Like um, this is a video I have. Okay. Okay. No output at all. Well, um, I do have a thin client. Um, I wonder if that's a virtual box thing. But I do have a, a Wizzy uh, S10 thin client that I've used and and this video file will play although it, you can tell it's just a little bit slow a little bit off so it does sort of work for videos but if you played a high def video not a chance you know but as you can see very nice looking uh, desktop very responsive um, all the applications work and this is a really nice um, really nice thin client experience I think